Thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Emmanuel Church. We are one church with multiple locations, and we believe God wants to bless you right where you are. In a few moments, you're going to hear some practical teaching from God's Word that I believe will be inspiring and relevant to your life. First, though, if you haven't yet experienced Emmanuel Live, we encourage you to go to our website, eclife.org, to check out our service times and locations so that you can experience Emmanuel in person or through our online campus. If this message blesses you and you'd like to support the ministry financially, again, you can go to eclife.org and click on the Giving tab and choose Online Campus at your campus. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope this message will be an encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. Emmanuel Church, good morning. How are we doing today? How are we doing, Emmanuel? You guys good? You ready? You ready to go? Banta, Franklin, Garfield, Park, Seymour, Martinsville, online, all the e-microsites. Are you ready? I'm a little jacked up today. Can't, you can't tell. I'm ready to go. Ready to go. We're going to close out a series, Becoming Rich. My name is Cody Johnson. I am the campus pastor here at our Emmanuel Church Greenwood campus. So good to be with you. I know that we probably got some new folks that are joining us today, some folks that might have accepted somebody's invite, I think we should probably welcome them appropriately. What about you? Can we welcome them? Make them feel good? Thank you for coming out. We know it can be intimidating sometimes walking into a new church, especially if you've never been to church before and you got some guy up here with a beard yelling at you. I get it. <laughs> so relax, get your coffee, settle in. We're gonna dive in. We're gonna wrap up this series today, Becoming Rich. It's been a three-week series. Pastor Danny's done an excellent job over the course of the past two weeks helping us navigate this false narrative. And if you've missed either of the first two weeks, go back and check it out on YouTube. I think it's gonna be a huge blessing for you. But the false narrative is this. Being rich is the best best life there is. We've talked about this for a couple weeks now. And some of you have fallen prey to this way of thinking. I am embarrassed to tell you that I have also fallen prey to this as well. I'm embarrassed. Like I've, I've thought this way before and I was trying to think about where, where this started. Like where did this all begin? And I think for me, it was the mean streets of Webb Elementary in Franklin, Indiana. I really do. Go spiders, eight legs, one heart. Franklin, it's right. If you've never been to the Franklin campus, Webb Elementary is right across the street from the Franklin campus. I am a proud alum, class of 1999, so go spiders. But yeah, like on the mean streets, difficult streets of Webb Elementary, you'd come up with these ideas of what it meant to be rich. And if I had what this kid had, life would be better. If I had what that kid had, life would just be the best. And you talk on the playground, you're getting your shoes dirty, you, you, you have these weird conversations when you're a kid, and you have these certain ideas that pop in your head like this. Like, if I went to your house and you had one of these, you're loaded. You're absolutely loaded. I don't know if any of you felt that way. You go to somebody's house, you're like, man, they got a massive trampoline. Like, they get to, they get to jump on that thing anytime they want to and potentially roll their ankle on a Tuesday. They must be loaded. That's so good. Good for them thought you were loaded if you had a trampoline. If I went to your house and I walked into your place of living, your bed, if I went to your bedroom and I saw that you had one of these bad boys in there, not just a personal computer, but the iMac G3, do you remember when these came out? All the different colors, they had like the blue, they had the green, they had the vivid orange. This one popped the most on screen, so that's why I chose this one. But you walk in there, I was like, man, you gotta know Bill Gates to have one of these. Like, that's incredible. Congratulations, you are rich. It must be so nice to be you. There was a guy I knew in elementary school, he had a flight simulator computer game that he could play in his bedroom. I was like, where is your plane? Like, you're the richest guy I've ever met. It was crazy. But that's not what did it for me. That was not the big one. The big one, the big one, like, man, if I could have what that kid had, life would be better. That was from, that was from a guy that I knew. Everybody has that kid that moves into your school every once in a while, and they're kind of mysterious, and they're kind of like the wind. They move in, they're there for like two or three weeks, and then you never see him again. That's what this kid was like. And it was the 90s. I don't even remember the dude's name, but the 90s in the Midwest, it's got to be like a Levi, a Cody, or a Zachary. We'll go with Zach. So we'll call him Zach. So Zach moves in. And all the girls think he's cute. He's got like blonde hair. Somehow he has highlights as an elementary school kid. He's flipping his hair all the, just giving it the business all the time. He looked like Sunshine from Remember the Titans. I don't know if you remember that guy. Just like back there flipping his hair, throwing the ball. It was good to be Zach. Good to be Zach. But Zach showed up one day and there was this rumor started like, man, Zach's got some money. Like, how do you know Zach's got some money? Like, did you see what Zach was wearing today? Zach showed up on the playground with this. Do you remember? 
You grew up in the 90s, like especially as an elementary school kid, you're rolling up in Franklin, Indiana, Webb Elementary in the Tommy Flag shirt. Are you joking? With the little embroidery stitching label on the left side. And not only did Rich Kid Zach, RKZ, show up on the playground wearing this, he would play in it. He would get sweaty in it. No care or regard for anything, just flipping his hair, getting sweaty in his Tommy. It was unbelievable. I was like, congratulations, Zach, on owning your own island. Like, (laughs) what a world to be RKZ. But then like you get a little bit older and you're like, man, like it's just silly because I, I don't know what Zach's life is like when he goes home. He was there for like three weeks and then he took his Tommy shirt and he left. I don't know what his life is like. Maybe it's not great having the Tommy shirt. Maybe having the trampoline isn't all that it's cracked up to be. Maybe that's not the way I should live my life or the aim for my life. Pastor Danny's done an excellent job helping us navigate Luke chapter 12 and this illustration that Jesus gives us about this farmer who's so blessed. He's got a great crop, a great harvest. What am I gonna do with it? Am I gonna give it away or am I gonna build bigger barns to hold all my stuff? he decides to build the bigger barns. I need more places for my Tommy shirts and my turnips and my trampolines and my corn. Like I need to have all this stuff for myself. I can't give it away. So then he builds the bigger barn. He says, I'm gonna eat, drink and be merry and that's the life for me. And then God comes to me and says, you're gonna die someday and then what? Then who gets all your stuff? Then who gets the Tommy flag shirt, right? And then in Luke chapter 12, verse 21, Jesus says this, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. This idea of being rich, being the best life there is and having a bunch of stuff and building bigger barns. You don't wanna be a bankrupt billionaire, someone who's got a lot of money financially, but you're broke spiritually. That's what we wanna avoid. We wanna adopt the true narrative, which is this. The wisest path to spiritual wealth is being rich towards God. That's what we're gonna talk about today as we wrap up the series. So the question is, what can I do to become rich toward God? What can I do today? Can I do anything? Absolutely. And the big idea that we're gonna talk about today is that you can invest in your soul. Write that down in your notes, invest in your soul. What is your soul? What is that? It's kind of a a squishy word. It can be kind of a churchy word sometimes, kind of hard to put your thumb on a little bit. Like if you ask somebody like, what's a hamburger? They're gonna be able to point at it and go, that's a hamburger. I know exactly what that is. I eat them frequently. I have a lot of experience with hamburgers, love them. But with the soul, it's a little bit different. Like it's, it's kind of like this intangible thing. You, you can't grab it. You can't see it. What is a soul? Well, Dallas Willard, former author and director of philosophy, who's a professor of philosophy at University of Southern California, had a great definition of soul. Check it out. He said, soul is here defined as the hidden or spiritual side of a person. It includes an individual's thoughts and feelings along with heart or will with its intents and choices. It also includes an individual's bodily, life, and social relations, which in their inner meaning and nature are just as hidden as the thoughts and feelings. It's a lot of words to say it's the unseen side of you. It's the part that you can't see, the part that you're trying to develop, your heart, your will, your soul, your decisions. How can I invest in those things? How can I develop those things if I want to be someone who's seeking to follow Christ in every aspect? If I wanna be rich towards God, how can I do that? Can I do that? You absolutely can. We're gonna talk about a couple ways when you can invest in your soul. But a more important question before we get to that is what happens if you don't invest in your soul? Does anything happen? Do I just stay neutral? Does my soul soul just kind of stay like right in the middle and nothing really good or nothing bad happens to it? Absolutely not. Think of it this way. If you don't invest in your soul, the world will invest in your soul and it will make deposits every single day. It will invest something continuously and constantly. If your soul, if you think about it like an apartment or a house, you can fill it with all sorts of things. If you're investing in it positively and you're trying to fill it with good things, you're trying to fill it with God, with prayer, with time and meditation and scripture, you're surrounding yourself with positive people who are trying to point you towards God, you're gonna invest really well in your soul and you're gonna fill that apartment or that house with great things and the world's not gonna be able to invest and it's not gonna be able to get things in. But on the flip side, if it's empty, the world will invest in such a way that you're gonna have all sorts of things move into your space that you didn't want. Things like lust, things like greed, Things like pride, selfishness, narcissism. You're gonna allow your thoughts to drift and the world's just gonna start to dominate a little bit. You're gonna have squatters. You know what a squatter is? Squatter is something that moves into a place where they don't pay rent and they don't belong and they just stay. And you can't get them out, right? 
So you're gonna have spiritual squatters. The enemy and the world is going to bless you with those things. And when you're gonna try to pry them out and try to get them out, you're gonna start to replace them with things like love and kindness and patience, that lust and that anger and that greed, that's gonna be hard to get out. So we want to avoid that at all costs because when the world starts to invest in your soul, your orientation towards God gets way off. And you don't want to become rich towards God anymore. You want to become rich towards the world. I got to have more stuff. I got to have more things, more sex, more status, and that will make me whole. But if you're joining us here today, you probably know that that's not the case. So we want to avoid that. So the first thing that we need to do if we're going to invest in our soul is develop a vibrant relationship towards God. Vibrant relationship with God. What is vibrant? When you think of vibrant, what comes to mind? Let's take my clothing today, for example. Would you consider the shirt that I'm wearing to be vibrant? No, it's brown and I look like the North American beaver. So, (laughs) not vibrant, not vibrant at all. If you're thinking of something vibrant, you wanna think of something with, with passion, right? With energy, with enthusiasm, with joy, With love, it's bright, it's strong, it's shining. It's something that easily catches your eye and you want to be a part of it. And I was thinking to myself, do I have an example of a vibrant garment that I could share with the church? And I absolutely do. Now, full disclosure, Pastor Andy down at Seymour and Pastor Matt on the online campus, you're going to hate this, but frankly, I don't care. (laughs) How vibrant is this? Don't boo, don't boo. At our other multi, you need to know at the Greenwood campus, there are people weeping right now because of how vibrant this is. They're being overcome with love and joy. Look at how vibrant and striking. That beautiful shade of green, your eyes are immediately drawn to it. You want to become a fan right now, don't you? I can feel it. I can feel it all the way up here. If you have questions about that after service, let me know. I'll help you along the way. A Dallas Cowboys fan stopped me in the middle of, or before the, the, the 11 o'clock service. He said, hey, I got another shirt you can bring up there. White, blue star on it. What do you think? I was like, it's kind of dull, don't you think? Like, <laughs> well, vibrant, right? What about a vibrant relationship? What relationships in your life do you have that you would consider to be vibrant? They're strong, they give you joy, they give you love, they give you hope, they make you laugh, right? I was thinking about those for myself. That's gotta be like, my wife comes to mind immediately. I would consider that to be a vibrant relationship. We laugh a lot, we have a great time. My brothers, my kids, my dad, those are vibrant relationships. We enjoy being in each other's company. We enjoy spending time with one another. It's borderline effortless being around those people. Well, sometimes with my kids, they're eight and four. So there's a little effort there sometimes, as you can probably relate. But You can have vibrant relationships with people, but you can also have a vibrant relationship with God. And so I was thinking, okay, what makes a vibrant relationship with people? How can we apply that towards God? What's the first thing I gotta do? I think you gotta think about them. You gotta think about God. If you love somebody and you're in a vibrant relationship with them, don't you think about them from time to time? Like, especially if you're in that that true love like phase, somebody you're trying to date. Man, I wonder what they're wearing. I wonder what it works like. I wonder what their hair looks like today. Got those warm, fuzzy feelings, right? You think about them. You think about them all the time. You want to know what they're up to, what their day's like. Do you ever do the same with God? Do you ever think about God's perspective for your life and all the things he's blessed you with, all the things that he's brought you through if if you've gone through something really hard? Have you ever thought about his will as you've read scripture? Have you ever thought about the way he's reacting to a prayer that you prayed a year ago and you're going back through your journal and you're like, wow, that was the result of that prayer? Do you ever think about him like that? Do you ever allow yourself to think about him, to just take time? Thomas Watson was a, a Puritan. He had this really great quote on what it can be like to think about God. He says, the first fruit of love is the musing of the mind upon God. He who is in love, his thoughts are ever upon the object. He who loves God is ravished and transported with the contemplation of God. It's almost like it takes you to another place, Right? If you want a vibrant relationship with God and you want to invest in your soul, fill your mind with God, with his ways, with his desires, with just his nature and the things that he has created. And I will tell you this, if you're sitting there in your guilt, you're like, man, I don't ever think about God. It's all good. This isn't a guilt talk. You don't need to feel guilty about anything. But you should know that God thinks about you. Did you know that? Have you ever thought about that? One of my favorite verses in scripture, I memorized it a long time ago, was Psalm 8.4. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? What is man that you are mindful of him? This is the psalmist just musing, just sitting there contemplating the beauty of the fact that we have a sovereign God, an all-knowing, all-powerful God who thinks about us. 
That's pretty cool, isn't it? And when you have that type of vibrant thought about God, naturally, you're going to want to talk to him, right? Like if I think about my wife all day, I'm probably going to shoot her a text. Same with my brothers and my dad. So the next step, if we're thinking about God, we want to continue that relationship, you got to communicate with him. Communicate with God. There are endless possibilities, endless ways you can communicate through God. Scripture has got to be one of the best ways to do that. I know some of you are like, man, I'm not a big reader. I understand that. But if you want to know God's heart and God's will and you want to have an active, ongoing conversation with God, crack that Bible open, crack that Bible app open and get to work. Ask questions. Read with a pen in your hand. Read with a highlighter in your hand. Read actively. Circle things you have questions about. Underline things that are striking to you. Bring verses to your small group that you want to discuss and memorize so that you can be a blessing to the people around you. Reading scripture is an active conversation with God. If you need help journaling and you want to be a little bit better at that or you want to navigate that or ask kind of how we do it here at the church, one way is called SOAP journaling. SOAP stands for scripture, observation, application, and prayer. If you have any questions about that, let us know. and We can send you a YouTube link or one of our staff members can talk to you about SOAP journaling. We love talking about that stuff. The P in soap journaling is prayer. Prayer is an amazing way to talk to God. James breaks this down very simply in scripture about how you can pray to God to communicate. Are any of you suffering hardships? Then you should pray. Are any of you happy? Then you should sing praises. Good, bad, tough, amazing, you lost your job, you got a promotion, it doesn't matter. Go to God in prayer. Express, communicate with him, talk to him constantly. A little while ago, my, my wife and I went down to Georgia. We went down to Savannah because my wife had a conference. She was like, do you want to tag along with me? And I'd never done that. And I was like, sure, I'll come down. So she would do the conference thing during the day. And there was no gym there that I had access to. It couldn't get jacked. And so I had to just walk around the city. And so I decided to just walk and walk and walk. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, Savannah's a pretty cool city. My dad would really like this. So maybe I'll just call him up and I'll just talk to him. So I just called my dad and started talking to him. My dad, oddly enough, was walking at the same time down in Franklin. We're just walking and talking on the phone, having a great time. No expectations, laughing a little bit. And it just was so refreshing to be able to communicate that openly and freely. You have the same opportunity to do that with God through prayer. Anytime you want, anytime during the day, just let him know what's on your mind. Good, bad, hard, whatever it is, let him know and talk to him. And then you start to think about him. You start to communicate with him. Then you're going to progress to step three. You're going to involve God in everything. You're going to want God to be with you everywhere, all the time. You're going to want to bring him into your life at every stop, every avenue. Doesn't matter. You're going to want him to be with you. In Romans chapter 13, Paul has an amazing way to phrase this, how we can bring God with us all the time. He says, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about the ways to indulge your evil desires. Hang on here for just a second. Clothe yourselves with with the presence of Jesus. Think about what your life would be like, what your investment in your soul, how rich you would become spiritually if you could clothe yourself with the presence of Jesus Christ. When you felt a little anxious, feel a little nervous, like things are overwhelming, you don't know what to do. If you, I clothe myself with the presence of Jesus Christ, he's going to reassure me that we can get through it, right? If I clothe myself with the presence of Jesus Christ, then when someone of the opposite sex sends me a message on Facebook, flirting with me and I'm a married man or a married woman, I'm not gonna entertain it because we're not allowing the squatters to move in because I'm clothing myself with the presence of Jesus Christ, amen? amen? If I'm clothing myself with the presence of Jesus Christ, when I have a really tough meeting at work, somebody starts getting a little chippy, start mouthing off a little bit, and it's easy for me to start to kind of like get a little bit mad, get a little bit puffed up. If I'm clothed with Jesus, I'm not gonna get mad. I'm gonna be patient, because I know that the God is acting upon that person's life just like they're acting upon me, right? You gotta bring Jesus with you everywhere. Investment in your soul, you're gonna become rich towards God. It's gonna be a beautiful thing. Your life will change if you do those things. Now, as we look at the clock in the service, we've got about, I don't know, 15 or so minutes left. Some of you are thinking, man, that's pretty good. We can wrap that thing up and get out of here and go get some lunch, right? We can just get Joey out here. Joey can come and start tickling those keys a little bit and play us out. We can get the guy on the drum and just start to crash out those cymbals and we almost knocked that over. We can leave and we're good because that's what I need to focus on. If I'm gonna invest in my soul and I'm gonna be rich towards God, I just gotta worry about me and my walk with the Lord. That's all I gotta worry about. That's it. 
And if you're sitting there today across all of our campuses, watching online or at Greenwood, and that's your perspective, I would say congratulations, you're halfway there. (laughs) You're getting closer. We're halfway there. But I know this is a struggle with people because to some people, to invest in your soul is to only think about your relationship with God and nothing else. Just me and God, and that's it. That's all I gotta focus on. If I do that, I'm gonna be good. And what I would say to you is if that's the way you're looking at your soul investment and becoming rich towards God, you got about 50%. You're leaving a lot of meat on the bone because there's a whole world out there that you've never seen. You have no idea how beautiful it is. You have no idea what it's like because it is true that we are called to develop a vibrant relationship with God, but there's also a second part. You're also called to pour out all the love you have to other people. And that seems contradictory because it's like, well, if I pour out all the love I have to other people, then that's really an investment in others. That's not really an investment in myself. Oh, no, 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 it is. Because from the perspective of the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And then there's a second commandment that's equal in importance, no drop in importance whatsoever. They are the same. It is to love your neighbor as yourself, right? Develop the vibrant relationship with God. Pour out all the love I have with others. It is a both and, not an either or. But a lot of us are looking at it like, well, I can do one or the other, right? If I just focus on me, I'm gonna be good with God, no problem. Don't really need to worry about the other stuff. And then on the flip side, I know people like, if I just show up and I serve and I do, 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 and I give and I serve, but I don't spend any time with God, then that's gonna fulfill this richness towards God that I need. No, it is a both and. You must do them both. I think sometimes we get confused about what our judgment day is going to be like. You ever think about that? You ever think about what that final conversation is gonna be like with God, or I guess the initial conversation face-to-face with God on your judgment day? I don't think God is necessarily gonna look at us and ask us about all the Greek words that we studied. I don't think he's gonna ask us about our checklist on the YouVersion app. Although it's good to stay consistent with your Bible reading, did you check all the boxes? And if you didn't, like there's some judgment there. I don't think that's what he's gonna ask us. I think a lot of us think that like if we show up to heaven and I show up to God and I say, God, like I'm ready. Like I've been prepping for this exam. I've read The Divine Conspiracy by Dallas Willard. I'm good, like I really am. I've read the Portable Seminary and Master's Level Overview in one volume. I've not read this book, just so you know. (laughs) C.S. Lewis, The Complete Collected Works, God, I'm good. Like I know this this is of greatest importance, but I've read that. So like you and I are square, you know that. I've also read this book about Paul, by Charles Swindoll. This guy looks like the dude from the West Wing, Richard Schiff. I don't know why they made Paul look like that. God, I've also got multiple Bibles, multiple thick boys, chunky boys. That's the ESV right there. That's the study Bible. God, I've got so much good stuff or you wouldn't believe it. CSB study Bible. God, I'm so good. You ready? Let's have that judgment day to me. Ask me whatever you want. I'm ready because I've worked. I've invested in my soul. I'm rich towards God. I'm sweating in a brown shirt. God, what do you got? (laughs) Flipping my hair like rich kid Zach. I'm here all day. God, what's up? And this is good. Nothing wrong with this. This is fine. But I think God's gonna ask you a different question. I think God's gonna ask you something more along the lines of, did you do all that you could with all I gave you? I gave you the books, gave you the Bible studies, gave you the ESV and Dallas Willard and C.S. Lewis. I gave you all those smart people. It was great. But what about my sheep? Did you feed my sheep? You had the opportunity to join a small group. Did you do that? You had the opportunity to make the small group experience not about you, but about the other people. I said in scripture that I wanted you to bear each other's burdens. Did you do that? Or just kind of make that about you? Couldn't find a small group that was comfortable for me, so I just kind of stepped out of the whole thing altogether. About 35% of our church is engaged in a small group across all of our campuses in Emmanuel. 35%. With the time and the love and the effort and the spiritual gifts that I, give, that I gave you, Cody, did you step in and did you serve people or did you opt out for other reasons? Did you decide that you were in a season of life and that season was never ending? And through that season, you couldn't step in and serve in any capacity. We have 35% of our church that is currently actively serving on the impact team in any capacity across all of our campuses. With the financial resources I gave you, Cody, Judgment Day, you had the books, that's good. But the money I gave you, what did you do with it? 
Did you give? Did you bless somebody? Did you give to the church so, so that student that's having a rough time at home could show up on a Sunday night for a student night and they could have some snacks and they could have something to eat? Or did you keep that for yourself? Because I know those save boxes cost money, right? So you have the opportunity to partake in the $10 challenge. Did you kick anything towards that or did you just kind of keep that for yourself? What were you doing with what I gave you? Did you do everything that you could with what you had? I think about that question a lot. I truly do. I think you should too. Because if I'm investing in my soul, I must, I must Spend time with God as much as possible. Think about him, communicate with him. Bring him everywhere with me. I've got to do that. But to invest in your soul, you must love other people. You must. There's no either or. It's gonna be 50% investment and then you're just gonna be walking around like, man, like, why does this feel off? Why doesn't it feel complete? Because you're missing like half of it. And some of you didn't know that before today. Now you, now you kind of know the deal. Peter, Paul, Jesus, they all talk about it. Let's hear what Peter says in 1 Peter. He says, you were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. I love what he says next. He says, love each other deeply with all your heart. Love each other deeply. Past the surface level. Past what is considered normal past what you're willing and really sometimes ready to give in the moment. You gotta go beyond, you gotta love deeply. That means when you show up to Thanksgiving and Gam Gam's sitting next to you at the table and she's talking about that trip, trick hip, that old trick knee that she's talking about and you've heard that story 50,000 times and you don't wanna listen to her, how are you gonna love her deeply? How are you gonna love that classmate deeply that's so arrogant and so full of themselves and you can't stand to listen to them talk about themselves again and again and again, all the stuff they have and all they've done. How are you gonna love them deeply with all your heart? Because that's the call. You wanna grow spiritually, you wanna invest in yourself, you wanna become rich towards God, love people deeply. Man, Paul puts this on a completely different level in Romans 13. I've read Romans before. I know a lot of you have read Romans too. It is a great book in the Bible. Man, when I read it as I was preparing for this talk, it was like kind of not put me on my heels a little bit. I was like, I did not notice that language before. In Romans chapter 13, Paul is talking about submitting to authority and honoring those who are in authority. Like pay respect to those people, whether they're in government, whatever leadership position is, is ahead of you, like you need to honor those people. You also need to pay what you owe. Like if it comes to taxes, Paul gives the example in Romans chapter 13, like pay the taxes. Don't be someone who is unreliable. Pay what you owe. But then in Romans chapter 13, verse eight, Paul says, owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. What do you notice about this language? There's not a lot of leeway in it, is there? There's not like a lot of option. He's like, you, like, you owe this. Like if you're gonna follow God, this is something that you owe to the people around you. Like it's your obligation to love one another. Like if you're gonna follow Christ and this is how you wanna live your life, this is a consideration that you need to think about. Like owing, like the rent is due every day. And this is something that you never pay off. You invest in people every single day. The opportunity is going to be there every single day to invest. I got people that'll come up to me sometimes like, you know, I love the mission of our church. Love it. We exist to see people come to Christ and grow in Christ. Grow in Christ. Love that mission. Love it. We celebrate coming in Christ a lot. How many people were saved? How many people text saved? And we should. That's the most, one of the most important things we should celebrate, if not the most. But then people say, what about the, the growth in Christ part? When are we gonna, we gonna dig in on that a little bit today? We're we gonna dive a little bit deeper? And I always ask them the same four things. Do you give? No. Do you serve? No. Do you in a small group? No. Did you invite anybody to service this weekend? No. And we're talking about spiritual growth? How much growth do you have if you participate in these three things? How much growth spiritually and investment in your own soul in addition to the soul of others if you join the impact team? That's the same path that Jesus walked. Service, sacrifice, reducing yourself to the lowest possible state so that you may lift up and push forward other people. 
You wanna grow in Christ? Serve someone and then do it again and then do it again and then serve when it's not convenient for you. And then to take it a step further, serve expecting nothing in return. You wanna grow in Christ? December 4th, Impact Team Night. We'll see you there. You should do that. Weekend services. When's the last time that you invited somebody to experience what you experienced the first time you came here or the second or the third time? How much humility does it take to invite someone to a church service? How hard is that to be able to recount your own testimony, to lower yourself, to realize that I'm probably gonna get rejected. This person's probably gonna think I'm a weirdo. They're probably gonna judge me a little bit, but I'm going to invite them anyway because I know what's on the other side of this invitation. Eternity with God. You think there's any spiritual growth in that? What about small groups? Bearing the burdens of another person, sitting in a circle, listening with empathy as another person is vulnerable with you and you have to be so patient with them and so loving and so kind. We have these things built into the framework of our church. And like, like I said, 60 to 65% of you, you're, miss, you're missing it. This isn't a guilt talk. I know that I should be so scared to give this talk because church research shows that people feel so guilty and so condemned. That's not what this talk is about. This talk is about you becoming rich towards God and getting that other 50% that you're missing. I know because I talk to you guys about this week in and week out. So do the other CPs, campus pastors. That's an acronym, by the way. There's a guy who gets this. His name's Alex. He's a guy that's in a, a small group, but he's not just in a small group. He leads a small group of students. So he's on the impact team. He's serving in groups. He's been with us for a while, and he understands that an investment in his soul means to invest in the lives of other, the lives of other people and other students in his community. Check out this video, and you'll hear about the impact it's not only had on his life and his soul investment, but the lives of students around him. Check it out. Hi, my name is Alex Bauman, and I attend the Greenwood campus. Um, been coming to Emmanuel for since around 2010, 2011, right before my kids were born. Um, so me and my wife, Lindley and Grant and Ruby, they are nine and 11 now, um, attending Greenwood campus. So I started serving in student ministries when Aaron Beasley took over the um, pastor position, I asked him, hey, if you ever need any help, I'd be love to come along and serve with you. And so he called me into his office and we um, led me over the um, ideas and goals that they had in mind for high school ministries. And I jumped right in. Um, I started um, coming to the services, the weekly services and um, leading a small group with um, actually my wife, Lindley. She started coming along and we started serving together. And then as it grew and time evolved over time, she had to step back and help with the kids more, but I still wanted to continue and move forward with that. And um, so it just evolved from there, from camps to retreats to Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, all the things, you know, involved with student ministries. We loved every minute of it, which brings me to present day where I'm still serving and going to camps and um, now helping out with the um, International Student Leadership Program. I'm gonna take students to uh, Columbia this summer, um, so I'm very excited about that. So looking back on my time of serving with high school students, it's neat to see high school students serving now um, in their adult lives on weekend services, like singing and or back in children's ministry, uh, growing up, getting married, staying involved in the local uh, church on staff here on, uh, you know, capacity, you know, like Logan and Alyssa. And it just makes me so warm and fuzzy on the inside to see them serving back. It's a lifelong walk um, to see the students, you know, serving um, Jesus locally, you know, it's, so it's very rewarding to see that go long-term, um, you know, more than just, you know, Sunday nights at high school ministries, you know, it, seeing them on their daily walk with Christ and growing um, is what's truly important. So also looking forward in the future, I'd love to see how my kids will uh, get involved someday and um, the student leadership program, the international program um, over in Colombia or other countries in the future. It's just so neat to see how from going from one campus to now seven campuses, including the online campuses, um, it's just so neat to see it all come together as one vision. So Alex, so over the course of the last nine years, you have impacted over 100 kids. Did you know that? Did not know that. Yeah. And some of them send us a few videos for you to watch now. Hey Alex, I hope you're having a good day. I just wanted to come here and say thank you for being my group leader and that just for helping me grow in my spiritual walk. 
And I just want you to just say, like, keep on going. Keep doing what you're doing. I know God's going to use you in many ways to reach as many kids as possible. And just also thank you for uh, being there for me in Colombia. And I just hope that you have a good rest of your day. Alex Bowman has made a huge impact in my life. We first met at camp this summer, and he was my small group leader. Didn't know him really. We, we've like had passing glances, but um, he made a huge impact in my life during that camp because during that camp, he was just always there, super kind. No matter uh, what happened, he was always up and trying to get the group uh, like excited about what we're going to do. During small group time, he really helped me advance my faith and was just trying to get me to learn more about God. That's awesome. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I love it, so. <laughs> that's, that's what it's all about. Like, I think that that video sums up so much of what we've been talking about over the course of the past three weeks. The only difference between you and Alex is that at some point Alex made a decision and then he acted on it. And for some of you, it might be time for, to, for you to make a decision you need to act on it as well. You've been praying about it for a while, you've been thinking about it for a while, you've been talking to people, you've been seeking wise counsel. Maybe it's time for you to make a decision and act. And you gotta figure out what that next step is for you, giving, serving, small groups, inviting the people to weekend services. The giving piece is something we've talked about quite a bit throughout this series. Because I don't know if you realize just how many, how many people's lives are changed when you decide to consistently give to our church. I started giving to this church, I think about 11 years ago. I haven't looked back. Guy had a conversation with me about it, told me what Jesus said about it, what, what it says in scripture about giving, told me the impact that it had on his life. And I was like, man, I'm in, let's go. And I just started giving. I didn't even really know what I was doing. Like, I don't have a theology degree. I, like, I had no idea what it was. I was like, okay, I'm gonna trust God. This is a way for me to exhibit my obedience and my submission to him. I need to do that because I need to grow. I need to invest in my soul and the souls of others. So if you're in that same spot, there's three lanes you can check out. One is the $10 challenge. Did you know that between last week and this week, 60 people have decided to join in on the $10 challenge? That's pretty fantastic. That's cool. All this means is that you're gonna agree to trust God with 10 of your bucks every week. $10 a week. Can you sacrifice a delicious Chipotle burrito every week? A drink and a lemon loaf from Starbucks every week. Can you sacrifice that? Because if you can, you can do the $10 challenge. You can do it right now. Scan the QR code, get going. Because that $10 might be an opportunity for a student to fill his belly a little bit when he shows up to a student night. It might be, it might make the difference. You don't know how that's gonna make the difference over time. 60 people, $10 a week over time is gonna make a massive difference. So if that's you and you're ready to trust God that way, do it. Or if you're ready to join the kingdom crew and return the tithe, you wanna trust God with 10% expecting that he will bless your 90. The only place in scripture where God gives us permission to test him is about giving. This is a great area to test him. Will you put God to the test with your tithe? Some of you have asked, do I do like net? Do I do gross? That's between you and God. That's not the focal point of the heart posture. The heart posture is submission and obedience. And the third lane that you can join is maybe the legacy team. Maybe you're a person, as Pastor Danny said, you've got a skill set to generate wealth. That's just something God has blessed you with. Or he's blessed you with finances that are above and beyond what you need for your living. You're like, hey, I have space to give. I would love to make an impact. How can I do that? Let us know. Your contribution can help us with the next campus or a project that we're trying to fulfill so that we can launch a space where people could come to Christ and grow in Christ. There are e-microsites that could become campuses. The only difference is people who are willing to give. There's three lanes. None is greater than the other. It's just a different option. Which one will you choose? Are you ready to choose one day? Are you ready to step in? I know a lot of people, when they get to this point, it's like that moment where they gotta make a decision. The response sometimes is, I'll pray about it. And that's good. And I think that you should pray about it. I think you should pray about everything. But if you're praying about what to do, I don't know if you need to do that. I think you need to pray about when and how it's going to get done. I think you need to remember what it felt like to come to this church or any church where you truly landed and felt the life-changing power of the gospel for the first time. Remember what kept you there. Remember what brought you to that place. Because a lot of you come and you continue to come because of the warmth of the people that serve you or the messages. You continue to come 
because of the small group, because maybe they stepped in in a really hard time in your life or the life of a friend, and you're like, man, it made such an impact on me. That's why I end up sticking. That's great. Ask yourself this question. When are you going to invest in the things that brought you here? When are you gonna do it? Put a name to it, put a date to it, start. Because somebody needs you. Somebody's life will change because you are stepping in to serve. And that will not only invest in their souls, that'll invest in your soul as well. And if you're sitting here joining us today, and maybe this is your first time, you've got a different decision to make. Because I was like you too. I was laying up in my bed before I was a Christ follower and I had the job, I had the degree, I was making some money and nothing worked. Nothing worked, nothing fulfilled, nothing satisfied. I remember sitting there thinking, is this it? I thought if I had all this stuff, then that would be rich. And then my best friend invited me to a church service and I came and I heard about Jesus. And then my world was just turned upside down. And maybe that's where you're at today too. And maybe you have to decide how you're gonna live your life. Am I gonna keep chasing the things that the world tells me are gonna make me rich? The money, the status, the sex, this, that, or the other? Or am I gonna chase Jesus? Am I gonna realize that Jesus died on a cross for me, suffered for me, sacrificed for me, expecting nothing in return except obedience and love, and he rose from the grave three days later, living a sinless life all the while? Are you gonna place your faith in that and follow that type of love, or are you gonna follow something else? Because if you wanna make that decision today across all our campuses, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer, and every single person at all of our campuses is gonna be praying for you. So with every head bowed, if you're ready to make that decision, you just go to Jesus and you just take these words I'm gonna say, make them your own. You just say something like this. You say, dear Jesus, I don't wanna chase worldly wealth anymore. I've done that. And the hole just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Jesus, today I've realized that you are what satisfies. So I place my faith in you today, your sinless existence, your death on the cross, your resurrection. You paid the debt for my sins. Help me to love others and love you for the rest of my life. Jesus, I give you my life. In your name, we humbly pray and we all said, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, we wanna celebrate you. We wanna give it up right now. Can we celebrate across all of our campuses? We have got a gift for you. All you need to do is send us a text message. Text the word SAVE to 65248. We wanna put one of these in your hands. If you're at Greenwood, hit the info desk. If you're at any of our other physical campuses, go to your predetermined location. Pick one of these up, and then if you are online, let us know. We're gonna send one in the mail to you wherever you're at. Inside, we got a new gift for you. It's a cup is our way of saying thank you. New Believers, New Testament Bible. And next steps so that you can get started in your walk with Christ. One more time for anybody joining us today for what God is doing through our church. We thank you so much for joining us for the service. Right now, I'm gonna kick it to local teams for dismissal.